Good morning. So good to be together with you this morning. Please turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel according to Luke. If you don't have a Bible this morning, we do have a stack of them on the Connect table right outside in the hall. Uh, feel free to grab that. If you don't own a Bible, we'd love, to, we'd love for you to take that home as our gift to you. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 15. Please join me in prayer. Well, Sovereign Lord, we come to you today aware of the grace that we have received from you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you, Father, this morning for creating us, for sustaining us, for providing for us, and for drawing us together this morning to hear from you. We thank you for speaking to us through your holy and authoritative word, and we pray now that you would open our eyes to see your beauty through your word. We pray, God, that you would open our ears to hear the word of truth that is profitable for our lives both now and for eternity. And we pray, God, that you would let us leave here today more aware of your grace than of our sin, more aware of your provision than of our need, more aware of your power than of our weakness. Let us leave today rejoicing, God, rejoicing at the wonder that it is to be your sons and daughters. And let us leave here today more emboldened than ever before to join you in the work of befriending sinners, of seeking out the lost. We pray this in the mighty and magnificent name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to look at one of the most well-known and most loved sections of Scripture. It is certainly one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. What we're going to look at is, is the very heart of the gospel. We're going to see the very heart of God unfolded before us. We're going to see the heart of Christ in this chapter. What we're going to do is we're going to walk slowly through this, through this text, making a few observations along the way, and then we're going to look at a few points of application at the end. And what we're going to see is that the love of Jesus transforms our understanding of God and it radically reshapes our relationship with the lost. Follow along as I read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you... Having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And before we go on, before we notice anything else in this, in this section, I want to draw your attention to one verse prior to where we just started reading. Look at the last verse of chapter 14 where it says, He who has ears to hear... Let him hear. And then look at verse 1, where it says the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Now, these, these chapter divisions are very helpful in a lot of ways, but they are not inspired in the text. They weren't designed by the author. Luke didn't write chapter 14 and new story chapter 15. Rather, he intended for you to read that verse and then the very next verse. And so the point he's drawing is, is to see that the tax, and, tax collectors and sinners, these are the ones who are drawing near to hear him. Let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the tax collectors and the sinners, they draw near. They are, they are allured to Jesus and they are hearing, they're listening, they're leaning in hanging on every word that he has to say. The tax collectors and the sinners. Now, you're, you, you've probably, you're probably familiar enough with the Bible. You're probably familiar enough with the teaching of Scripture to know that the tax collectors, the sinners, these are, these are not well-respected people in the community. 
They were something of a class of scoundrels. They worked for the Roman government. They had purchased the right to collect taxes and, and really to extort the people in the land. So they were extorting them. They weren't just collecting taxes. They were collecting the taxes and then adding on top of that for their own personal benefits. And so, so these were a despised people. They were corrupt men working within a corrupt system. They were not well regarded among the people. They were exploiting the people of Israel at great cost. These people would have been identified by the people of Israel as ceremonially unclean, people that you would have nothing to do with. They were notorious for their dishonesty. No respectable Jew would associate with a person of this caliber or even be seen with him. Now, many of you are familiar with the, uh, with the wonderful event just down the road from us called Bethlehem and Burnett. There's a church that hosts this event every year, and we, I love to take my family to this. And the, one of the highlights of this, this is, a, this is an event where you go in and you walk in and everyone's in character. So they're all dressed like the, like the people of the first century, like this time. And so you feel like you're walking around Bethlehem, and everyone is talking, and, and they're using language that is foreign to us. And, and the high, one of the highlights for us is where we stand the longest is the tax collector booth. It's so much fun because you walk up and you see this grimy guy who's got a frown on his face, and he's sitting there with quill in hand and ink, and he's surrounded by these gigantic Roman centurions, these guards that are very intimidating. I don't know where these, they find you know, multiple men like Wes Prater that just stand there with these gruff looks on their faces, and they're collecting seemingly arbitrary amounts of taxes from these poor young shepherd boys who come up and, and they argue their case and they say, I have 10 sheep. And, and the tax collector says, I'm, I'm going to charge you for 20 sheep. And then they're, they're pocketing the rest. This is one of, the, one of my, my boys' favorite moments. And the, one of the things that is a highlight is, is if you're staying there long enough, you, you'll see the Roman centurions take someone to jail. If they don't have the money to pay, if they refuse to pay for any reason, the, these gigantic guards will, will take these guys by the back of the neck and walk them into jail. And it's, a, it's an event to behold. Now, it's comical for us to go, but it wasn't comical in this day. This was a real event. Th these were real people, and they were really despised and despicable. And yet, when these tax collectors and sinners, when they draw near, when they come in close because they are drawn to the person and the teaching of Jesus Christ, what does it say that he does? He doesn't reject them. He doesn't shoo them away. It says that he receives them and he, he eats with them. Another version says that he welcomes them. He welcomes them sinners. He welcomes the despised. The, the Pharisees and the scribes are standing there and they're hearing this. And they're saying, how can he allow them to be here? Not merely putting up with them. No, friends, he is welcoming. He is glad that they are there. Jesus is glad that these sinners are coming in and leaning in, listening closely. And so the Pharisees and the scribes, they look on with horror and with judgment. This is a shocking moment for them. How could he receive such disreputable people? How could he welcome them with gladness? How could he eat with them? What is going on here? Why would he simply tell them to depart, tell the wicked to get away? Why not gather with the holy people someplace else? And the answer that Jesus gives is simply amazing. His answer gets right to the heart of what this text is all about. It gets right to the heart of what the gospel is all about. So Jesus answers them with a collection of parables. First, he tells them about this, about this shepherd who pursues his lost sheep. And then he tells a, a parable about a woman and her lost coin. Then he tells another longer parable about these two sons, one who is lost and another who is lost but didn't realize it. And this is all in response to the muttering of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's very important that we see that everything that follows here follows from these first two verses. This sets the stage. This sets the context. Why does she, he share these parables? Because the scribes and the Pharisees are looking on with self-righteous judgment. Now, Jesus speaks in parables partially because they're easy to understand. Everybody can relate. And as soon as he starts talking about a shepherd pursuing his lost sheep, everyone has the image in their mind. We can all relate. And he even puts them into the story. He says, which one of you He's speaking in plain language because there's a specific point that he wants to communicate. 
There's a particular purpose that he shares all of these stories. Each of these stories is really one story that we're just looking at from three different angles. We need to understand that all of this is in response to these Pharisees. So Jesus is making the point that God is committed to befriending the lost. He is committed to seeking the lost. He is seeking to find what is lost. Jesus is revealing his heart for sinners like you and me. He is boldly displaying his love for sinners, his welcoming of the outcasts. There are lost sinners who are being found, and there is much joy in heaven as a result, he says. Jesus is saying, look, this is what I'm like. I am like this shepherd. He's fulfilling biblical imagery of the good shepherd. You think through all the prophecies that talk about the good shepherd. You think about Psalm 23, and Jesus is saying, this is who I am. I am the good and faithful shepherd who will not abandon my lost sheep, but I will leave the 99, and I will go. I will endure. I will, I will walk through the briars and the thorns. I will go through the mud. I will take the time, costly as it is, and I will find that lost sheep. I'm going to carry it on my shoulders. And, and if, you've ever, if you've ever been around sheep, and you imagine them going through this land. They are dirty. They're smelly. They're probably covered in mud. And he's going to pick up that lost sheep once he finds it. He's going to stick it on his shoulders. And he's going to run home, rejoicing all the way, calling all his friends, rejoice with me for my lost sheep is found. That's what Jesus is saying. Or look with me at verse 8. Where it says... Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And Jesus is saying, This is what I'm like. I am like this woman. I'm like this woman who lights my lamp and takes my broom, and I'm sweeping the house. I'm taking my lamp because it's dark now. So there's not a lot of windows. There's not a lot of light coming in. I'm taking my lamp, and I'm getting close to the ground, and I'm looking around carefully trying to find it. Have you ever lost something like that? I remember when I got married, not a man who's, who's ever worn much jewelry, and we got married. We go on our honeymoon, and we're, it's, it's not very long before my new bride recognizes that there's no ring on my finger. The ring that she had chosen for me, the ring that she had just hours before placed on my finger is not there. Have I so quickly abandoned my vow? <laughs> and so we look, and we look in the hotel, we look in the car, we're trying to figure out where is this ring, and we're looking closely because it's this small thing, and, and my goodness, we looked so hard, so far, so wide, and we couldn't find it. It was lost the entire honeymoon. We get home, Go into the, into the bathroom, and there it is on the bathroom counter. Found the whole time. Jesus is saying, this is what I'm like. I am diligently going about trying to find this lost coin. Why is that? Because it's valuable to me. Because it matters. This coin, one among ten, matters to me. And I will not stop until I find it. When I find it, I'm just so happy that I want to tell everybody about it so that they'll rejoice with me. Now, this, again, would be scandalous to the ears of the Pharisees and the scribes because the, the women of the day were not held in high honor. They weren't, their testimony wouldn't have been allowed. And so for Jesus to use a woman, much less a shepherd or, or tax collectors or sinners, as a, as a positive example would have been shocking to their ears. But Jesus says, this is what I'm like. I'm like this woman looking for her lost coin. And then at the end of each of these short parables, to make explicitly clear, to make sure that they understand what he's saying, what's going on, he tells them, listen, there is much more going on than a woman finding her lost coin or a shepherd finding his lost sheep. God is doing something here. God is up to something. God's purpose is being enacted. His purpose is being accomplished. God's heart is being revealed here. He's at work. Look with me again at verse 7 where he says, I tell you there will be more joy where? In heaven, there will be more joy in heaven over one last, over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. 
So this isn't just about what's happening in the small room with a dozen or so people there. It's not just for the tax collectors and the standards and, and the Pharisees and the scribes who are standing there. No, Jesus is telling them that what is going on here is much bigger than that. Heaven is being affected by this. Heaven is being affected by what's going on here. They are looking on. Just like this testimony we just heard, heaven is looking on and they see this woman say, I believe, and heaven erupts with praise. That's what's going on, much bigger than what's happening in one small hospital room or what's happening in this room here. And then Jesus goes on because he's not done telling his story yet. He he tells them another parable. If you look with me in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this, your son, came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, you are always, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. On the wall of my office across my desk hangs a print of a famous painting by Rembrandt. His, his depiction of the return of the prodigal son. It's this beautiful portrait. Very well known. Books have been written about it. It was a gift in celebration of my ordination that my wonderful wife and some dear friends got together to purchase for me. And as I I sit at my desk, I I look at it, and I I think about each aspect of the painting. And I see the father's embrace. It, It shows him standing there with a softness and a gentleness with his arms extended to his son who is before him. He's embracing him with affection. And I think about the amazing love of God for sinners like me who who welcomes sinners, who befriends the outcast, who receives the wayward. I think about the gentleness of the heart of Christ in that moment that is depicted by the Father. 
And every time I say, do you know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced that there is no sinner who is beyond the reach of God's grace. There is no one who is too far gone. There is nobody who has sinned so greatly that the blood of Christ can't cover that, that God the Father won't eagerly and joyfully welcome him back. That's what I think about as I see this painting. There's no one too far gone. He welcomes us all if we will but turn to him. But there's another figure in the painting. There's this figure that, that is standing there looking on at the father as he interacts with the son. And he's not completely expressionless. He looks a, a bit confused and, and possibly annoyed. He's certainly withdrawn. There's no joy on his face. Unlike the father, his arms are not extended out toward his younger brother. He's not reaching out. He's not expressing any welcome whatsoever. Jesus tells this final parable, and I just want to point out a few, a few details before we get to application. First, the obvious thing is that the relationship has broken down between the father and this younger son. For this younger son wasn't just coming and saying, hey, dad, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go out on my own. Can I, can I get my share of the inheritance? No, what he was asking was a highly offensive thing. You see, the property wouldn't have been divided until the father died. And yet this younger brother comes and asks for the property. He says, give me my share of the property now. Indicating that the property was of more value to him than his relationship with his father. He may as well be dead for all he cares. He just wants the money and to get on with his life and to have nothing to do with his family. So his relationship is broken down. His heart is far from him. And then the father astonishingly agrees to give it to him. When you think about this request and how appropriate it would be for the father to respond indignantly and say, get out of my house. Who are you? Who are you to ask for this? Who, think, who do you think you are that you deserve this? And I would give you this at all, much less before I die. How offensive this is. But the father agrees to give it to him. And so the younger brother takes this share. He gathers all he has. And you notice he says that he, he goes off to a far country. He goes off to live the good life. And he does. He lives the good life. He has freedom. If you ever launched out from your parents' house, you think about the freedom that you're going to enjoy. Get out of the tyranny of your mom and dad. Freedom from the tyranny of his father's rule. And he has a great time. He's spending money, living the good life. He has friends all around him that are, that are celebrating with him. They are there for the party. He does that for a while. He goes off into this far country, which is, would have been a place where the religion and the customs of his people, everything familiar, everything that his father raised him to appreciate and to, and to enjoy would have been foreign where he was now. And so he goes there. Completely rejecting all that his father's raised him for, but soon enough it was all gone. And it says that a famine arose in that country. Now, suffering befalls the righteous and the wicked. No one is immune to suffering. But oftentimes we see in our own lives and in, in Scripture that God will use circumstances in life, including famines, to pursue the wayward. He will use things like this to, to get our attention. C.S. Lewis says that suffering is the megaphone of God's voice to get our attention. And so he began to be in want. This was a new experience for him. He had never known want before. All his life, growing up in his father's house, he had known provision. He had never known need. He had never known famine. But now he was in want. And so he hired himself out to feed pigs. Now think about this for a moment. Pigs, for us, no big deal. We enjoy bacon and pulled pork tacos and, and all kinds of things. But for the Jew, this was an unclean animal. This would have been extremely degrading to think about feeding pigs for a Jew. This would have been the lowest of the jobs. And not only is he feeding the swine, it's not, he, 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 and by the way, feeding the, the swine, it's not like you walk up and just throw the stuff into the pen. You're getting in there. And you're, you're picking up the smell of the pigs. It's, it's in your nose and it's on your clothes. You can't get it off of you. 
And this is what he's doing. He's even envying the food that they're eating. So he has been reduced to the most degraded condition imaginable. And then in verse 17, this glorious verse, it says that the younger brother came to himself. He came to himself like he came to his senses. He came to himself and said, what am I doing? What am I doing? He experiences the gift of repentance and determines to return to his father and to plead for the mercy of working as a servant in his house. And so he returns, but before he can even get there, before he even arrives there and gets everything out that he wants to say, the father sees him while he was a long way off, it says, and he runs to him. And so you think about the, the dress that, this, that these people would have worn, and, and you could appreciate this if you went to the Bethlehem and Vernon thing where the, these guys would have been wearing robes. So to run, he would have needed to grab his robe and pull it up and run. This would have been a very undignified thing for an for a older man, for a patriarch of the family to do. It would have been undignified. He would have, he, it would have been more appropriate and respectful for him to stand there and allow him to come. But he runs to him with great joy and zeal undignified as it was, and he embraces him, and he kissed him, and the son could barely get, you've got to appreciate how the son is eager to get this out, he's, he's, he's worked on this, the whole journey back, he's memorized what he's going to say, and he's working on it, he's, he's trying to cultivate the, the appropriate disposition, and he's trying to say, Father, I'm so sorry, but before he can get hardly any of it out of his mouth, the father embraces him, he, he cuts him off, he's interrupting so full of joy and affection, so ready to welcome him home. He, he puts the best robe on him. Who, who would have the best robe in the house? It was the father. He gets, the, he gets his own robe and puts it on his son who's been hanging out with these pigs. Think about this picture. He's coming back in, in tattered clothing. He's, he's got nothing. He, he smells. And the father's embracing him. He's getting him the best robe in this house. His own personal robe puts it on him. He gets the ring, which would have represented the authority of the family. And he puts it on his finger. He sees that he's barefoot like a slave, and he puts shoes on his feet. And then he calls, and he says, bring the fattened calf. We're going to have a party. We are going to celebrate the return of my lost son. And friends, notice what the father doesn't say. He doesn't receive him and say a single word about his son's sin or his foolish behavior. He doesn't hold it over his head and say, I'll receive you back if you never do that again. You'd better live up to better standards, son. He doesn't say a single word of it. He receives him with joy and gladness. He doesn't rebuke him or warn him that his forgiveness is attached to his future behavior. The one thing that stands out here is the overwhelming joy that his son has come home. My son is home, he cries out. Rejoice with me. My son who is dead is now alive. He was lost, but now is found. So there is great joy. And then we read in verse 25, to discover the, the older brother does not join in the celebration. He's not happy. He's not excited. He's certainly not running out to embrace his brother who has returned. Rather, he's angry. The older brother's indignant. He stands there. You can imagine him saying, I cannot believe he's throwing a party for that scoundrel of a brother of mine. For this disrespectful, untrustworthy man. He doesn't even call him his brother. He says, this son of yours, and, and notice what he says, he's, he's been with prostitutes. Well, we don't see that. But the brother in his anger is likely exaggerating the circumstances. I mean, it may be that he did, but, but he wants to point out, he's going to paint him in the worst light imaginable. It's like he can't even comprehend mercy. It's like he just doesn't get it. Why is that? It's like he had never recognized, he had never, never appreciated his father's kindness to him. Have you ever been in one of those moments where, you, where you've received nothing but good, and then you see someone who received something that you don't think they deserve, and you think, about, hey, what about me? Have you ever seen somebody respond that way? It's because the older brother didn't know anything of his own sin and his own need for mercy. I like how David Wells describes him. He said there's a, a smug self-righteousness 
in having played life by the rules. The kind of self-righteousness that finds grace incomprehensible because forgiveness for him, it seems so unnecessary. We've all heard, maybe come from our own lips or others, I, I don't need, I mean, I'm sure that there are people who need Jesus to die for them, but I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I don't, I don't mess up. I, I, I try not to you know, do anything where I need to ask for forgiveness. That's what the older brother is doing. Is he is saying, look, I'm, I'm a good man. I'm a righteous man. And he can't comprehend his own need for mercy. And so how does the father respond to this? How does the father respond to this self-righteous older brother who is absolutely inappropriately indignant over his brother's return? He goes out to entreat him. He goes out in gentleness. He goes out in affection. And he's appealing to him. Son, come in. He doesn't slap him. He doesn't say, who are you to question me? Charles Spurgeon says, I hardly know which to admire most. The love of the father when he fell upon the neck of the prodigal. Or the love of the father when he went out to talk with his elder son. Both received the same mercy, the same gentle disposition from the Father. He loves both the ignorant and the wayward, the self-righteous and the, and the haughty. He loves the sinner. He befriends us. He comes to us. This is amazing grace indeed. Here we see the heart of God the Father in his gentleness with both the wayward and the self-righteous. Jesus wrote these parables. He shared these with the Pharisees and the scribes to strike at their hearts, to get their attention. They would have read this and they would have understand right away, hey, hey, he's talking about us. They would have heard very clearly that they were those who saw themselves as more worthy of the love of God than these sinners were. Notice also that in these first two parables, you see that the, the same theme is that there's someone searching. There's someone who's going out and pursuing, looking diligently for what is lost. But where is that in the third parable? He shares these together in quick succession. And the point would be, shouldn't there be someone seeking? Edmund Clowney recounts the story of a young man who was a U.S. soldier missing in action during the Vietnam War. When the family could get no word of him through any official channel, the elder brother flew to Vietnam and risking his own life, he searched the jungles and the battlefields for his lost brother. It said that despite the danger, he was never hurt because those on both sides of the battle respected the quest that he was on. Many of them referred to him back then simply as the brother. This is what the older brother in the parable should have done. This is what a true older brother would do. This is the point that Jesus is drawing our attention to, that he came to do for sinners what the shepherd did for his lost sheep, that he came to do what the woman did for her lost coin, that he did what the older brother should have done for his younger brother. Jesus did what the Father does in this parable. He welcomes and rejoices over the return of the lost sinner. Jesus left the glory of heaven. He took on the weakness of human flesh, born a baby, grew up in a, in a hard world where he experienced the misery of sin and weakness. He lived the perfect life that you and I are called to live, and he died the death that we deserve bearing our guilt, bearing our shame, that we could be welcomed into the house of God, wearing the righteous robe that he purchased, wearing the ring that he deserves, having a party in heaven thrown for us. What a mighty God we serve. So how do we respond to this passage? How do we apply this? Lots of things that we've seen Throughout this text, lots of lessons that we, could, that we could discuss. But here's the reason why I chose this passage. As we start the new year together, as a pastoral team, we've been talking and praying about priorities for the church, where we see the Lord working in our midst, in this church, and in this community. 
And one of our convictions, one of our burdens, is that the Lord Jesus is calling us to join him in seeking out the lost. The Lord Jesus has given us a great commission to pursue the lost and proclaim the gospels, making disciples until the Lord returns, promising his presence, promising his, us his strength, promising us his spirit to help us, which means that we're eagerly desirous as a church to see the Lord rescue sinners throughout our community, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our family. To see conversions happening, to hear more testimonies of of the lost sinners found. We believe there are men and women, boys and girls in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our sports leagues, and all throughout our community who desperately need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed and lived out in their midst. So here are two ways that we want to respond to Luke chapter 15 as we start out this new year. First, is we want to marvel at the heart of Christ who welcomes sinners. The one great truth taught throughout this chapter is the love of Christ for sinners and his pleasure in saving them. This is so amazing and counter to every culture that ever has been. Every instinct we have, before we do anything else in applying this, we want to marvel at this. We want to recount our own salvation. We want to recount the Lord's work in how he drew us to himself. Maybe, maybe you were born into a Christian family. That's not normal. That's not the standard throughout the world. That is uncommon. Maybe your parents discipled you and raised you to know the gospel. That is glorious. We want to thank God. We don't want to take that for granted. Maybe, maybe you were saved in, in your teen years through a through youth group or, or in college through someone sharing the gospel with you like I was. Maybe it was later in life that the Lord sent someone, some messenger, like a Lori Ramos, to come and befriend you and just to get to know you. And, and, and more and more you saw the work of God in their life and you, and you walked into a church where you experienced the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. How did the Lord draw you? We want to marvel at that. We want to marvel at the fact that he welcomes sinners like you and me, calling us out of darkness and into the magnificent light. But there's a danger, we want to apply this because there's a danger in neglecting this. There's a danger like the elder brother of taking for granted what we enjoy. In his famous sermon, A Divine and Supernatural Light, Jonathan Edwards said, there is a difference between believing that God is holy and gracious and having a new sense on the heart of the loveliness and beauty of that holiness and grace. The difference between believing that God is gracious and tasting that God is gracious is as different as having a rational belief that honey is sweet and having the actual sense of its sweetness. One of my sons enjoys hot sauce. He's a good Texas boy. And we got, we got one from Bucky's called Scorpion Salsa. It says very hot on the description. And my son opened it and, and offered me some. And I, I read the description and said, okay, this is going to be very hot. I believe that it's very hot. But once I put it into my mouth, woo! <laughs> I experienced that it was very hot. There's, there's a, there's one, it's one thing to look at the gospel, to read this parable and say, that's, that's, that's cool. That's great. It's another thing to put yourself in the story as the one who has been in, being entreated. Whether it's the younger brother who is wayward, whether it's the older brother, and you find yourself self-righteously judging others, and you experience the entreating love and the gentleness of Christ Jesus. Have you experienced that? Do you, do you know the beauty of the Lord? Do you marvel when we sing songs together? And we're going to sing another song in a minute. When you sing songs, do you experience the truths that we sing about? Or are they just words that you sing stoically on the screen? We want to taste the honey. We want to read Luke 15 and come away freshly amazed that these aren't mere parables that teach us helpful lessons about life. But these tell our story, and that is one of amazing grace. So we want to marvel. Marvel at the heart of Christ who welcomes sinners. And secondly, and finally, we want to join God 
in seeking out the lost. God, you notice throughout these parables, he, he presents the shepherd, he presents the woman, not as passively waiting, not as sitting there just, okay, well, if I find it, great. If not, no, they, they weren't indifferent. They were passionate. There was a zeal. There was a going and a pursuing and a looking. They were eagerly, intently pursuing what was lost. Yes, Jesus welcomes the penitent, but, but Jesus bore the cross Took, taking our shame, pursuing us, that he might bring us home to the Father. He didn't just wait for us. He pursued us. He sent people to you. The heart of God is that no one would perish, brothers and sisters. He looks upon every man and woman, boy and girl in the world, that he is created in the image of God, and he respects them all. He looks at them created in, in his image, and they have an inherent value, and he goes to them. I remember seeing a movie a, a number of years ago about this man on death row, and this nun goes to him because he writes to her asking for, asking for spiritual help. And she goes to him, and this man had committed atrocious sins. I mean, he was truly despicable. And nobody wanted anything to do with him. He didn't have any visitors. His own family despised him. But she saw with a divine perspective a man created in the image of God that was worthy of hearing the gospel proclaimed to him. Every man, woman, boy, and, and girl in this world deserves to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. God values them all. Everyone in this room, everyone in our community, everyone in your neighborhood and at your workplace, all have the image of God imbued in them. So let me ask you this. Who is the God that we reveal in the way that we interact with sinners. What are we communicating? How do, what do you communicate? Through the way that you interact with your neighbors. Through the way that you interact with your coworkers. Are you, do, we, do we reveal a God who's indifferent? Do we re reveal a God who loves and pursues and seeks until he finds? Not just seeking for a while, you notice the shepherd seeks until he finds his sheep. The woman seeks until she finds her coin. Having the confidence that God the Father can do anything. Having the confidence that the, the God that we know and worship pursues us with his grace and welcomes us while we are yet sinners. Not once we clean ourselves up, but in the midst of our mess. In the midst of all of the muck that we live in. In the midst of our rebellion, he pursues us. And sent his son to die for us while we were yet sinners. How we see God's character, brothers and sisters, how we see his character will determine what we reveal to, about him to others. So study your salvation. Study the gospel. Marvel at it and join God in this. God wants those who understand his heart to, to join him in, restore, in restoring sinners. By telling the parable of the lost sheep this way, Notice he says, imagine which of you would not leave the 99 to pursue the one? Which of you will not join me in pursuing the lost sheep all around this city, he says. That's what he's calling us to do. So here's, here's just a, a couple of very, very specifically practical ways. Bart referenced these, these, these uh, Bible journeys, these scripture journals, that we have for everybody. We have a lot of them. We'd love for everybody to take one home. So you know, it's not just one per family, but, but grab one. Whoever wants one. If we, if we run out, we'll get more. Grab these. these. This is a wonderful way. As we start the Gospel of Mark next week, we're going to spend all year, longer? Longer than all year <laughs> in this Gospel. So grab this and own it and write throughout it and, and make observations, highlight in it and circle things. Make observations, and, and here's one idea is, is start right here on the first page and just prayerfully consider who are those in your life that God might, might be calling you to pursue. Who are, what, what two or three names come to mind that if you could pray and ask God to save anyone in your community, anyone in your context, anyone in your circles, whether it's in your neighborhoods or workplaces, your family members or, or sports leagues or you know, homeschool community, whatever, whatever it is, who, what two or three names come to mind? 
write those down and, and, be, and commit to praying for them and return to them. Take an interest in those God has placed in your community. I, I so appreciate about the testimony this morning that <laughs> Lori shared that she, she says, I, I don't consider myself an evangelist. But I see in Jesus a man who befriends sinners, who welcomes them. We can do that. We can take an interest in others. We can get to know their stories. You, you will be, like Lori, surprised at what people will share with you as you take an interest in them, as you, as you say, tell me more about that. Practice that. Practice learning their stories and getting, it, getting to know them. And don't be afraid to ask me, I'm so sorry, you shared with me something the other day, I forgot what you said. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I'd like to hear more about that. Follow up with that. Offer to pray with people. You will be surprised at what the Lord will do through our weak efforts. So take an interest in people. Get to know their names and ask them for their stories. And look for ways to connect their stories to God's story. Look for ways that they're seeking refuge in life apart from Jesus. I have this, this friend on the East Coast, and he owns a gym. And I love how he described his role there. So he, he sees himself as an ambassador of Christ wherever he is. And he says, what I do is I do a lot of sales. So I, I have people come in my door every day talking about gym memberships, and they tell me all these reasons why they need Jesus and all the reasons why they think that fitness is going to be their solution. And they're not literally saying, I need Jesus, and therefore I'm going to lift weights. But they are saying, you know, my life is falling apart, and I, I just don't know. But I, I think that I'm going to start by, by getting in shape. Now, great, good, get, get in shape. But that's not the solution. That's not your refuge. A new job or a spouse or a better spouse is not the solution. Jesus is their refuge. And the people in our community need to hear that. And finally, we want to pray. We want to pray our guts. We want to pray that the Lord will work on their hearts. But quoting, uh, quoting Mark McCloskey, the Lord will, will move in them by first moving in you. So pray for a heart that is burdened for the lost. Pray for God to open our eyes to, and to see with divine perspective, to see with compassion and love, to see with gentleness like Jesus, to see through eyes of faith that God can rescue anyone. Is there anyone who comes to mind for you that you say, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that the Lord would save this person or that person, but not that guy. That guy who looks a certain way or talks a certain way, acts a certain way, I can't imagine that the Lord would ever do that. There is no sinner, friends, who is beyond the reach of God's grace. There is no sin that cannot be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is able. So let's pray to him for that help.